Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Dunbar, and welcome. Thank you so Thank very you. much for, for joining us. We, we had already done the formal, the formal introduction earlier. Uh, and so without further ado, I just want you to take the floor again. Thank you so very much uh, for being here with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it's really a pleasure, everyone, to be in your midst, to be in your retreat. And um, I'm looking forward to the time of sharing as well under your theme. And I do love the theme of uh, your retreat, Undiluted Love, since it is what the Lord himself has asked for. It is what he gives to us, undiluted, unconditional love. And hence, we ought to give same to our spouses. Uh, um, are you seeing the screen? Are you seeing the PowerPoint presentation? No, we're not. Uh, who, is, who is handling okay. that? Okay. I'm trying to share that with you as well, even though I, I, I don't necessarily I, I prefer for you to pay attention to me, but I understand the need for persons to have information, you know, where they can see it because we are kind of visual synesthetic generation. Um, you're seeing it now? Um, what's here? It's usually the host who shares the screen. Um, so Petal, we need to probably share it with you to share, but we can, we are supposed to be able to share. We need to give her permission to share. Question again. So we have prompted the share screen. It is just um for you to be able to be able to um to see it. Um, are you able to see it now? Yes. Yes, we are. Slide show. All right, so you're able to see it now. Okay. I I would want you to go to see it. All right, so um, love is such a wonderful thing, and there is uh, truly no nothing more gratifying than a relationship with someone that you love, someone that you trust, with whom you can share your innermost thoughts and feelings, and having a partner to rely on and to have your back through life's ups and downs is one of God's greatest gifts to us. But I'm not sure that we fully understand and are appreciating the gift that God has given to us. But choosing that person is a decision because life isn't like the fairy tales. It's not really like the movies, you know, always romantic, always easy with a happy ending. You have to make the decision carefully because falling in love and planning weddings are great romantic activities. And most of this is done when I meet with couples who are preparing for marriage. You know, everything is so peaches and cream and hanky-dory because, you know, they're, they're putting the plans together and everything. You know, so it is, it is almost as if planning weddings are, are most often done while wearing what we consider to be rose-colored glasses. Everything, all the gifts that you receive and everything else make it seem like Christmas happens twice per year or for you, Thanksgiving happens twice per year. But there's an important gift that... One must give themselves, and that is the gift of awareness. Every married person needs the gift of awareness. Every individual in a marriage need the gift of awareness in order for their marriage to thrive and survive. Awareness of the reality of life, right? We need the awareness of the reality of life and, 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 and the rigors of marriage after the the, the novelty and the honeymoon is over. We need an awareness that both parties have to choose to work on that relationship. And you choose to work at the relationship 
wonderful feelings you experience uh, during the courtship period and the marriage. So you need that, that, that honeymoon. And, and so what am I saying? I am saying that uh, you need to understand that the honeymoon doesn't always last. The novelty wears off, uh, all the butterflies in your stomach and all the goosebumps on your arm, all of that uh, has a time period and will eventually subside when the reality kicks in and the rubber meets the road, as we say here in Jamaica, right? And so what I'm saying is that deciding to enter into a committed relationship such as marriage is a decision that should not be taken lightly. Till death, those part is serious. And when the novelty wears off, you have to know who your potential mate really is. Because in Jamaica, we have a saying, or my grandmother used to say, come see me and come live with these two different things, right? And so when you get to know who your potential mate is, what kind of person they are, what are their goals in life, their moral and spiritual beliefs, their character, whether or not they are emotionally stable and available, the health issues and the works, because lots of times spenders marry savers and risk takers marry conservatives and Aggressive people marry passive people and proactive persons marry the reactive person. And it's not until after the honeymoon is over that you discover the reality, which is why I put so much um, store on ensuring that you have proper premarital counseling because it is important that that happens, right? The novelty of love, it where we have to know and what we, we do, right? Because love gives fresh perspectives and everyone will fall out of the novelty or the honeymoon period, but not everyone will fall out of love or stop loving. And I like to say, wine gets better with age, but so also should love, right? And the novelty is fading over time, but love should not fade. It should grow with time. Now, the ancient... Um, Greek as eight words that corresponds to different types of love. So we have the eros, it is the romantic and passionate love, which marriage cannot do without. Then you have the philia, which is affectionate love, which marriage also should have. There's a secular song that says, how can we be lovers if we can't be friends? It would pay us wise to know that. Right, so the filial affectionate love is also important in a marriage because the truth is, a couple should be friends before they become before they become wed. You know, oftentimes we 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 are lovers before we are friends, and that ought not to be the case because the secular world knows that we need to know that. So the filial love is also important. Then we have the agape love, which I think the theme of your retreat is based on. You use the word undiluted. Right, the Lord, you, the, the, the Greek uses the, un, the agape, the, the selfish, unconditional, universal love, right? And then, and, and that is embodied in the John 3, 16 context of Christ, loving us, the world, in order that he gave everything that he had for us. Then there's the storge. No, the storge can speak to um, familiar love or empathy. Right, and, 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 and it, it could also go into erotics, right? And then you have the mania, which speaks to obsessive love, not a very healthy kind um, to some extent in another context. But if you're obsessed with love for your spouse, it is quite fine. As a matter of fact, you ought to be um, based on something that Solomon says that we're going to talk a little later on. Then there's the ludus love. Ludus love speaks to playful love. This is also important in marriage, right? And oftentimes, some of these elements of love is missing from our romantic, our marital relationship. And then there's the pragma that is called an enduring love, right? And that is also necessary because the word of the Lord tells us in Mark very, very clearly, 10 30, it says, we, He said, Whom God has joined together, let none. Full asunder, yeah. so it should be a until death do us part. Oh, that's right, the ladies and gentlemen. Now, pardon me, are you talking to me? Hello, no, okay, right. 
So the, 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 I found that person's, the, 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 the making the statement about love, it's, it's so ephemeral, it has no, no lasting, enduring quality to it. But the enduring love is important because it is until death. People are now rewriting their vows because they want to put in to it that I will love you until I stop loving you. That is really not how it is supposed to go. It is until the death of someone. And then there is Dacia, which is a self-love, which is also important in a context. It is important and especially when I am speaking to singles, I speak to that because it is important to first love self before you can think of sharing self with another person and to love self and self and to understand the gift of self that you have gotten, right? So the fact is that the fall in love is some effortless and seemingly automatic. And I have come across some who doubt the veracity of their love for their spouse and he questioned whether the values and lifestyles are compatible and that is why i consider the wisdom and counsel again of premarital counsel as a semi-final plea for such a life altering decision such as marriage because I said earlier the emotional road gets bumpy and the tires flatten out all the time so what gets better based on your theme what gets better hold, hold our breath it gets better so what get better and how could it possibly get better after after all we are we, we we experience during the honeymoon we think we experience the best of the best you don't even want to come on after that phase right so what gets better well i say the love gets better the connection gets deeper the the intimacy gets more intense and well for the sex well definitely hold your breath because it definitely gets better and what do I mean by that? It means that you intentionally, purposefully, creatively strengthen and deepen your love. Why? Because everyone will fall out of the moon phase, right? But not everyone will fall out of love or stuff. And if a man has recently married, based on what uh, Moses has placed here, right? We understand that love grows with time. And so it takes time to do that, right? The, 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 the first phase. You know, we, we experience that is, is the quick weekend because that's usually what the time we take to say we are going to spend that time devotedly in the presence of each other, paying attention to nothing else and looking at our spouse. But that is the lifetime commitment of marriage that we often don't pay attention to. This is what God says. It's marriage is for a lifetime. There is no day off. There is no vacation. A lifetime of paying attention. To each other right so we normally take this little time off and we experience that weekend depending on our financial trust and our, our abilities to plan and to save and to effect whatever it is and so the feeling of excitement and heightened sexual arousal and then the nuance and the slightly obsessed lust which can be very addicting at first you don't want that to end right substantial love on the other hand provides stability partnership deeply intimacy and trust and shared values above all the bible says in first peter 4 8 you must love deeply or fervently because love covers a multitude of sins it will help us to get past the unforgivables right and let me add this other insight now go back to that let me add the other insight no go back go back right yeah, this one and i want you to look clearly at that text this is moses he said, if a man has recently married, then he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him for one year. He is to be free to stay at home and bring happiness to his wife. Now, this is the NI translation. If you were to read it in the King James Version, it would say that he is to stay at home, cheer his wife. And the word cheer there, when you look at the semantic range of the Hebrew word, it means to know intimately and to know deeply, to know in a yada sense of way but what Moses really wants us to get here is that love takes time love takes time love remains when circumstances change right and so that is what Moses is saying he's saying that it shouldn't be over in a flash as a matter of fact people were able to follow Moses's directive 
right? Our, 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 our novelty in our mind would last longer because it will be born out of a more deeper, profound knowing of our spouses with time spent in focus. And this level of knowing is what trims the fire and keeps it burning longer and brighter. And then the end of the novelty stage, so what that ought to do is to mark a deeper connection where lust becomes love. Because, as I said, love is a circumstance change, right? So you have to recreate love with foreplay, yeah? And I want you to understand that when I say foreplay, you have to understand that I'm not talking about touch. I'm not talking about caressing your spouse uh, physically, right? Or touching them at an erogenous spot. That's not what I'm talking about. Because foreplay is a precursor to everything. We're anticipating something like you guys came to this presentation. Never mind your job, baby. I am hearing children in the background and you need to me that children are here because presentation can get erotic later on. So please help me to understand how I'm to tailor my presentation, right? Um, I didn't know that children were going to be there. So I, I need to now know how I should speak, right? But that's what, I, what I'm saying to you is that love, love, See, it, it remains when the circumstances change, when you have been together for a long time and you begin to take each other for granted, that all other. Love ought to remain even when the circumstances change, even when the novelty wears off, even when you no longer have that level of attractiveness that you came in with, even when, when, no, when you no longer, when you gentlemen no longer have the biceps and the triceps kicking. When we, you know, and when the water ripples off you, it is something different. When you ladies no longer have the vital statistics that you came into the relationship with, love remains, right? It remains when circumstances change. So you have to learn to recreate love with foreplay, right? How do you do that? You love intentionally, you love actively, you love deliberately and purposely and decisively, and then you love tenaciously. So you love. And, and the word intentionally, that's what it talks about. To be deliberate, to be purposeful, to be decisive, to be tenacious, right? You need to love actively because you can't be passive about this thing. Christ's love was not passive. God's love was not passive. And it is the same love that we are now um, manifesting, showing, expressing towards us. So you need to love creatively. God is a creative God. Look at what he did in seven days. And so if God is a creative God, then we are a creative being, right? And are you hearing me well? All right. So um, you need to love creatively. You need to bring out some of the creative genes that God has given you into the relationship. And then you need to love sexually. Which sex is an expression of love. Sex should not be done without love. So there should be love first, then there is sex. So we need to love sexually, and then we need to love eternally. So let's begin with intentionally, right? Because intentional love both speaks choice and an effort. And sometimes you want it. things to just happen, but nothing just happen. You have to get up. And you have to make it happen because there is love and there is love according to John 16, 16, according to all the Greek words that I told you earlier on that is embodied in love. Because no matter how much passion there is at the beginning of a relationship, for love to last, it has to be actively created. Because happiness is not something that we just that does happen to us, and love is not something that we just fall into, even though it may seem that way when a relationship begins. So no matter how much passion there is at the start for love and happiness to last a lifetime, it must be actively made because love is a creation. It's something that you work at. It is passion by acts of loving kindness, which can produce something that is beautiful and durable. Yes? And so it's an unparalleled life experience. And when we accept that, it will include great times of difficulty because it does. 
marriage, according to the Apostle Paul, is a problematic affair. And so it will include great times of difficulty. When we understand that, then we can approach our loved one with gentleness and care. And we can learn the skills that we need to solve our problems. Because marriage is not a walk in the park, right? It's not a run in the mill. We must be committed to grinding it out. No pun intended, or probably every pun intended. And sticking it in there. We have to continue this journey of love, right? So we have to prioritize time with each other. Quality now replaces quantity. The quality of our love, the quality of the together, right? Place quantity when we make our spouse a priority, right? You have to plan, you have to in time that you spend together in the real world, like retreat now, in this retreat. When you go back to the real world and you go back to work tomorrow, or probably some of you is later because of how the system works over there. Right? It can be hard to find time together as a couple. Having children in a home, like I heard the children just know, you're not even able to take yourself out from them for, for an hour to sit into a presentation to help you to mold your, your lives together because they are there and they demand attention. Right? Having children in a home can often magnify that difficulty right? because quality no replaces quantity. And this is where the quality of real life really replaces it because excitement is now replaced by intimacy, right? And, and so the novelty loss will drown, but the intimacy can increase over time. Intentional activation of your love has to be done if you are, uh, you know, if you're, if you're going to, to go on in your relationship. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to rekindle your relationship, right? And that comes from conscious decision to recommit to the romantic behaviors that you naturally had in the beginning of your marriage. It ought to get better. You can embrace the regular. You have to work at your love as an effect of the wonderful feelings you experience throughout the stages of love, right? So you have to learn to adjust your expectation because if your complaint is that your relationship feels ordinary and boring or regular, that you have stopped feeling that smart. And I have to compete. I'm going to be singing my voice, right? So if you think that your relationship is feeling ordinary at this point and it feels boring and it's regular and you're not feeling this part anymore. I've had couples come into my office ever so often. I'm afraid we don't love each other anymore. I don't feel the way I used to feel. You know, I don't, I don't want my spouse to touch me. I really don't want to make love. I'm just, I'm just, you know, and we, I would say all of these things. What you have to do is to think back to your dating and your courting days and remember all those text messages. Remember the love letter. If you're old enough, remember the telegram. If you are that old, remember the BBM before there was WhatsApp. Remember the email. Remember those times. You have to go back. We have this is the song that we sing in church. Roll back the curtains and, of memories now and then and show me where you brought me from and where you did. You have to be able to roll back those curtains if you are to keep focus in your marriage, right? If you are to keep focus on your spouse, things are going to happen. Your desires are going to change over time. Health issues are going to come into the play. But you have to be intentional. I have to intentionally remind myself that my husband needs sex. It's an intentional thing. I have to remind myself that he's there. I am I'm into menopause. And, and my libido got, gets low in my sex therapy. I have to remind myself. right? So you have to take yourself back to that state. So adjust your expectation. right? I often tell my clients to check the narrative, man. Because sometimes when couples complain about a stale relationship, it's based on the loss of those chemical hormones that are in your power to bring back the excitement. Start talking again. Communicate like you want it. Have dinner together and play footsie underneath the table. Where are all those times when you used to walk and hold hands? Everybody driving separate cars now. Nobody's holding hands again so you can scratch and middle. Where are those things? So you can rub each other's leg while you're driving. You're rubbing each other's leg. Eh? Yeah, man. So you can reach over a hand and you can touch your partner in their most 
area. Where are all of those things? Where's the kids? Where are those things? You have to adjust your expectation and things in advance that speaks to your future. The mission here is to have something to look forward to as a couple, right? And so you should allow yourself to drift into the humdrum, going home to work, coming back home, only to go back home to work again. Talk about something that solidifies the two of you in your future together. And this could mean planning your next vacation or planning a drive somewhere. That drive to where you, you might want to build your dream home or your dream house someday. I went to have my nails done the other day and, and the one of the the cosmetologist said, she said, she said, the red, you see that window over there? The window faces the hill where all of the elites live. And she said, that is where I stand every day and look up in the hill and stand, look at one of the houses and say, that's my dream house up there. You need to talk about something, right? Go somewhere, you know, and, and, and look at something. These kind of activities will remind you of both why you got together in the first place to build a future. Because if the future is already dimming, then something is amiss. You are supposed to be a couple that is chiseling out a common purpose and you have to be intentional about it and keep blaming each other silently for not doing it. Do something. You are responsible to recreate yourself in your relationship. If you look at me today, my hair is black. You might see me tomorrow. My hair is blonde. The next day, my hair is red. I believe in remaining interesting. I believe if my husband and I start making love now and in closing eyes too long, it's a different personality I am. Yeah? So I believe in remaining interesting. I normally say in Jamaica that I'm the vice president of the Wig Wearers Association. Yeah? So I, 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 I like to have many wigs. So if I start out love making in one character, I can flip character three different times. If it is interesting, that's what is something that you must look forward to, that you can hold your breath. Because you don't know what is coming next, right? So we need to do that, right? We need to have intimacy in our relationship. So we need to look actively, spend time with each other, talk and deepen your intimacy, right? There are different forms and types of intimacy. So I think it's one of the slides coming up, right? But emotional intimacy is a key component to a healthy marriage. When emotional intimacy is lacking, and suffer deeply. And so maintaining emotional intimacy requires work and attention. Restoring emotional intimacy after it is lost can be, a, can be a tough job, right? Because it can be hard to preserve it. And sometimes people don't develop emotional intimacy in the first place, right? And, and then they then they refer to losing it after a while. Ideally, both partners will be working on maintaining and building intimacy because our know, love is supposed to be so oh, I love my husband 40 years ago I said we supposed to love him I'm supposed to love him people right intensely right I need to use emotional intimacy and being emotionally available to your spouse because sometimes we are physically available but we are not emotionally available. You understand? So be relevant and interesting, ladies. Ladies, listen to me. I live in a country where you can get lingerie for nothing. Be emotional, be relevant and interesting. Find the places that have the things. These are supposed to be the tools of your trade. You're supposed to apply them. And gentlemen, the same thing applies to you. Ladies are tired of you wearing fruit of the loom and hands or wear cotton underwear to bed. Get sexy. Because you will be sorry if you don't. But it will be better too. So be relevant and interested in your relationship. Keep your relation fresh. You must remain fresh. You can't afford the cost. Boy, I'm going to church. God don't want anybody that look pop down. God wants you to look good. This is a temple of God. It must look good, right? And the husbands are, husbands are attracted by sight and touch. Ladies, husbands are attracted by sight and touch. That's why they can't keep their hands off you. That's why they're always groping around and their hands are roaming three places. I like to say they're, they're, they're roaming and stopping three places, breast, bottom, and vagina like AT&T. You need to understand that you have to keep your relationship fresh. 
Yes, emotional, we are crafted different by design. We are different people. We are different in our emotional needs. And it's the reason that God, through Moses, instructed the husbands to get to know their wives, spend time. Curses let the great sins. It takes time to know her. It's not an overnight thing. Gentlemen, spend time to know your wife because wives are ever changing. We are, we, are, we, are, we are multidimensional. We are ever changing like the waves of the ocean. And sometimes we don't even know what we want. It must be for you to know what we want. So you have to spend some time, right? And keep working at your relationship and keep the difference. Spend time with your wife and get to know her and connect with each other. And then there's mental intimacy. You must be able to have effective conversation. And I know that the paradox is that you can have a talk with your wife and a non-talkative husband, or a talkative husband, and a non-talkative wife. That's a paradox, right, of the gender in communication. But listen to each other with your heart. I learned to listen to my husband with my heart, not necessarily my ears, because my ears will hear things that cause me to be offended. But when I listen to him with my heart, then I am not offended. So listen to each other with your heart, because communication, communication involves sharing and listening. And women are said to be more linguistic based on culture and gender socialization. So both of you have to choose to work actively, to work at the marriage, because this is a relationship, it's not a situationship. Marriage is a relationship, it's a deep relationship. Many persons who are out there are in a situationship, and many persons who get married, get married because of a situation too. And so they're in a situationship rather than a relationship. This is a marriage. This is something that's supposed to honor God. Because our marriage is not about us. Our marriage is about pleasing God. Because our marriage is supposed to reflect the love of Christ for the church. And so we need to know. You have to choose to work at your love as an effect of the wonderful experience throughout the stage of love. Because every relationship takes work. Every relationship. So it takes purposeful planning. You have to be love active. Remain interested and keep your relationship fresh, right? And what we talk about, and here's, here's the, in the, and the different kinds of intimacy that is important for you to understand. There's emotional intimacy, and, and couples need to, come in, need to have emotional intimacy. They need to be attuned to each other emotionally, right? A wife can easily sometimes tell when something is off with her husband because we have, we have, we have female intuition. Sometimes a husband is totally clueless because he's so logistical. You understand and analytical, but you must have emotional intimacy. You must have spiritual intimacy, right? Um, the, 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 when we when we understand what the Lord says about the the unequal, and I don't take it away that it's taken, but I want you to know that you should be you should be focusing the marriage is a spiritual element as well. It's a spiritual thing, and so we need to be have spiritual intimacy where we can sit down together and 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 have times together outside of a retreat. You know, I, in December, I wrote, I published a, a 52-week couples devotional because I'm cognizant that the Lord brought it to my attention. Couples don't get to have devotions every day because of the different areas that you go for work. They go to separate ways. So I wrote a 52-week couples devotional. That is, that is good because if you spend 30 minutes in, in one week just to spend some time and, and connect with God, then it will be good. You need to have mental intimacy and mental intimacy it speaks to you being able to talk, to have conversations, meaningful conversations about different things, right? Not just about sex. Well, I shouldn't say sex because people don't talk about sex. They just do it, right? Um, but you need to talk about things that matters, about life, right? Then you need to have recreational intimacy. Our husband especially loves a recreational companion. Right? Some of you ladies, you don't know. Your husband play games. If they play remote games and, and out. You've never taken the time to decide them to, to, to try and know what one of the buttons on the control is about. You don't sit down beside them and watch the television and, 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 and act and react like you know what the ball game is about or the football or the whatever it is that they play. Right? You need recreational companionship. Then there's financial intimacy. This is causing too much problem in marriages. There's always a cash clash. Right, and so you need to have financial intimacy where you are, you are privy to all of that, and then you have sexual intimacy. Most of the time, most marriages only have sexual intimacy, no other form of intimacy there is. But you must have intimacy on all levels, all of these platforms is important for the sustenance of your marriage. That is how it is going to get better. That is when you can hold your breath because it is so deep, 
You can't get over it. You understand? So you need to understand what is supposed to happen as you continue to love actively. All right? So you need to be, and, and, and I just want to touch back a little bit on loving actively because it speaks to keen, energetic, enthusiastic, dynamic, and animated love, right? Where you, where you are relevant and interesting and all of that. Because once newness comes around, you know, and, and six months pass, then the flaws are coming out and the irritation starts coming to the surface. And one of the best things about long-term love is that you feel secure enough to say it when things have made you angry or annoyed. And often in the, in the early days, right, we are so keen to please or to seem to be pleasing um, that we let things go. You know, we don't talk about some things, but it bothers us, right? And so we won't acknowledge that the object of our affection is behaving badly or needs pulling up. And we don't want to burst into burst the bubble that we have, right? But you have to think back, like I said, to the love of the period. Part of what made it so great was that everything felt new, which means we experience high level of, 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 of hormone, which is known as, as a dopamine, right? And, and studies have shown that what stimulates dopamine in the brain is the novelty and the freshness and the interest. And so your love must be active to be fresh and relevant. So you have to both do what you need to do, right? Take, for instance, what men, what husband wants as opposed to what wives want. You need to know these things. These things are important. Commit to doing something you have never done before to recreate the same feeling, right? It doesn't have to be a zip line. It, it could be having sex in a new place. Yeah? What about trying it out, right? It could be, it could be, it could be trying different restaurants. It could be creating new habits as you grow together. Anything that feels new and different will produce more dopamine. And that's exactly what you need because lots of things distract and divide. And wear down our love, long work hours. That's one of the things. And most couples try to have love at night, make love at night after you're coming in from a long day. Where you find time for that? Did nobody even want, well, the men might need that. But that's not the best time. Early in the morning is usually the best time. You know? And so I'm happy for my husband. He goes to bed early and he wakes up like three o'clock and four o'clock because it's the best time. You're fresh. At that time, well, most of the time, like this morning, I crawl into the bed in the tree, right? But I'm eat up by five o'clock, right? But, but I usually say, you know, if I come in and I'm tired, I just tell my husband, I'm tired, honey. And so, you know, I said, I listen, I will sleep, I will rest, and I will wake up before the cock starts going and stop your cock from going. You just need to understand what is supposed to happen. It's tricks in trade and matches back to business, right? So a few decades ago, a couple would meet. You know, not late in the evening, but during the afternoon. And sometimes if you work in close proximity, you can do that. Yeah. Workplaces where they were shorter and more sane and people had more spare time and a man and a woman could cultivate, you know, their, their relationship like, like couples are doing. But today people are lucky if you see each other for two hours before going to bed, you're dead tired. And it is no wonder that people are drifting apart and that the divorce rate is skyrocketing. It is going to take purposeful planning. Dates are a must, even at home. Have a date at home. Hey, COVID was going on the other day and you were so restricted over there. You make a date at home. Have a date at home. Put the children to bed. Those children that I hear playing in the background. Put them to bed. Get them into bed early so that you can put on your sexiness and you can be as you dare and you can have some wonderful time. You can light a candle. You can you know, put on a scented candle, you can put on some music and you can do something. It's purposeful planning, right? And you have to do it. And what environmental change brings about a creator kind of newness, like when people go to that kind of thing, right? But you have to create a habit. Yeah? So you have to purposeful plan. Plan vacations together are a must, right? We can't be so mean because sometimes people are so mean to their marriage. I had a couple of the other day that told me that uh, vacation um, is, a, is, a, is something I didn't remember, don't remember exactly what he said, but like he didn't see it as a priority, right? But planned vacations are a must. You can't be so mean to your marriage that you can't budget, yeah? I, I, I throw a partner, we throw partners, yeah, I don't know what you do, or whatever it is, you know, that, that makes your time away nice. You know, you, you need to. I have, a, I have a, an event that I do and in October, at the end of October, every year called a sweet escape. You guys need to book and come for it next year. God's willing and COVID give us a break, right? 
where you come to recreate everything, where you learn different things, where you hear the perspective of different couples and you leave feeling sweeter because you have done something. You owe it to yourself. You earned it. You can't just work to leave all of your money for your children. Read Ecclesiastes, yeah? He said that is foolishness to work and leave all your money. You have to get a way to recalibrate your love and to reignite and to give your love traction. You know, look at grit. You need to do that. So it takes purposeful planning, right? So wives, I know you are um, natural nurturers. I know you are natural nurturers and so you want to have the kids and, and all of that. But remember that you have a husband, yeah? You do have a husband who married to be first in your life. You do have a husband who needs your attention. Right? You do know have a husband who you borrowed his breast and children and know him can't even send the breast unless the breast is traveling from the baby's mouth and to the Brazil. My husband loved to tell me that I always, if he touched my breast and I say, be yourself and himself, you have always said that the breast is best and it must satisfy me according to Solomon all the days of my life, even if it's not standing up like twin towers and they are sagging like zippers. So you need to understand what is supposed to happen. Right, we I, 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 we have heard persons who say them, them and them husband have gone for months and years and not have sex. How that happen? Men have drive and desire; they don't lose it; they lose ability. Yes, to understand. So it's not for lack of devotion. Your husband of ten years, and if you're equal partners in raising your children, you believe your marriage is sacred and forever, whatever adversities come. But when you have family, family. Listen, if you don't take the time for your marriage, you're going to go. The children are going to grow and they are going to go. Those little ones, even that are here, they are going to grow and they are going to go. And you are you are never told to be one with your children. You are told to be one with your spouse. You are never told in the Bible to be one with your children. You have to be one with your spouse. You have to prioritize your spouse now or be left a later. Many persons are getting divorced after 25 years, after 30 years. One lady came to me, one couple came to me. They've been married for 52 years. They're married for 52 years. And they came, they don't want a divorce. I had to ask her where she going with all the flubs and the cellulites. Because who can appreciate those flubs and cellulites at this stage? Where are you going now? Your husband can appreciate them. He knows how you got them. He gave you the children and all of the stress and the problem that gave you those flubs and cellulites. Where are you going with that? You understand? And, you know, the husband was very, I mean, the wife was very upset with me for saying that. But I call it righteous indignation. I'm just saying, why are you seeking to separate the assets at 50, at, at 70 odd years old? They were 70 at the time and married for 20 odd years. They had just grown out of love because they weren't actively making their love work. You know, they were just going through the humdrum of taking care of children and going to work every day and coming back and taking care of children and taking care of bills and never spending time on self. No. I want myself and my husband to be making love if it's even one time for the month when we reach the age of, of Abraham and Sarah. Because if Abraham couldn't get it up, thank God for Jesus, then Sarah would not have been able to get pregnant because it was not artificial insemination. The Bible said that Abraham went in and had sex with the wife and she conceived. So ladies and gentlemen, you have to pay attention to what you must pay attention to. Right? You have to, you have to you know, find the games and the things. There are games online that you can purchase. So up your little thing, you understand? You, we, we don't think we know everything about our partner. We don't, right? You, you, but but you, you need to just find whatever it is and make it work, right? Then I want you to love sexually. All right. And then I want you to love sexually. Um, Dr. Ed Wheat writes in his book, couples cannot just perfect sex on their honeymoon and then take it home and isolate it on a shelf. It must be practiced regularly. It must be practiced regularly. Sexual frequency speaks to a healthy marriage. If you are having increased frequent sex and you're not having sexual challenges like erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, vaginismus, or you're not having sexual trauma or any one of those things, then your marriage is not healthy. So you have to, you have to, if, you, if your intimacy is winning, you have to find it, to rekindle it, and get to kindle it, become more affectionate towards your spouse. Many couples realize that not only is sexual contact missing, but some simple 
physical contact has gone even longer. When you, when you, when you, are, when you revive the practice of touch, you ignite a new flame. Start touching again. I have been recently telling my husband that I hate the king size bed that I have. Because we like to be fat and have a king size bed. It creates too much space because we're not that big. We want a little bit more touch. Recently, we went back to our old home and we had a queen bed. And trust me, the touch was so alive and vibrant because you're, 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 you're rubbing up against each other. When you're rubbing up against each other, you're igniting stuff, right? So you want to be able to, 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 to love sexually. Too many times sexual contact is missing and simple physical contact is missing. You have to ignite the flame. If you don't know where to start, just hold hands. Just sit at the table and start rubbing your foot against each other under the table. Just spend some time cuddling together. Just lie in bed and talk and pour out your heart and soul like you did back in the early days. Before you know it, the familiar stirrings will, will revive again. They will return. Right? They will return. You should not, as a church, be ashamed to talk about something that God was not ashamed to create. And a lot of times we find that we don't do that. I would advise you to go online and get a copy of my book, Sexcription. It is a very good manual, biblically sound and theologically balanced to help you to maximize your sexual potential, to help you to take it home. This is where you do not know what to expect. This is where you would be holding your breath because it's intentionally erotic and you wonder where it comes from. It came from a holy God who lives in heaven where purity reigns and the angels cry holy, right? So you need to know what to start. Lie down in the bed and talk and touch each other, yeah? In Psalms of Solomon 4 and verse 16, a woman's sexuality is lightened unto a garden. And within a few years, gentlemen, a garden that is left to take its natural course will become a source of shame to its owner because weeds are going to grow up into the garden and some parts will run wild and some parts will die and weeds will flourish. So for a garden to do its own a proud, it takes skill and planning and hard work. The mere thought and effort we put into our garden, the more, the, more, the more thought and effort that we put into our garden, the more thrilling and satisfying the results. The results are going to be, right? And the truth is, if you have allowed the garden of your sexuality to, to run wild, you, even you ladies, if you have allowed the garden of your sexuality while it while or become wrong, might initially see little reward for your effort. You'll be tempted to give fear. If you have the determination to persevere week after week, you'll begin, you'll begin to enjoy the rich rewards. I have a garden outside. We have a lawn. And, and my husband is the one who mostly takes care of it. I like to see it tended. So I, you know, apart from him tending to it, I, I, I employ a gardener to come in. Every now and again, I make a landscaper come in. I want my garden to look fresh. The garden of your sexuality must remain fresh. If you have the determination to persevere, it can remain fresh. When you look at, at your wife, the Bible says husband. When you look at the, the wife, the sexuality of your wife, you must lose rationality. That's what the Bible says. It said you must be, you, you, you must, you, you must be intoxicated. Right? You must, if you lose rationality, it means that you're drunk. Just looking at the beauty of your wife. Yeah? You must go bonkers. Right? And, and so you have to get to complimenting like Solomon. Gentlemen, you have to get to telling your wife how beautiful she looks, how radiant she looks. Right? When Solomon, in, 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 in the book of Songs of Solomon, the, the whole the entire book of Songs of Solomon is a conversation between Solomon and his Shunammite bride. And when he speaks to her lovely and he, he, he speaks how her breast is standing up like twin tower and uh, her neck is so graceful and her eyes are so deep and beautiful like the river Nile and whatnot. Some of you gentlemen don't even know what color your wife's eyes is. You don't even know what color your wife eyes your wife have. Eh? And, and he compliments every facet of the woman, right? Then, then, when, then, then she, she responds. And when she responds, she at one time she responds, I think in Solomon chapter seven, she says, she says, I, when after he had finished complimenting her, she said, I have taken off my sandals. I have taken off my skirt. I have opened up to him. How can I put them back on again? We want, oh, you, you want your spouse to please you. Just a minute, I'm just taking some water. Husbands, you want your wives to 
to be sexually ready every time, like an energizer bunny. But we, when do you compliment her? When does she put on her clothes and you tell her she looks nice? When is she come from the hairdresser and you tell her she looks nice? When she cooks a meal, do you appreciate it? When she gets the outside, whether she does it or she employs somebody to do it, you know, do, do you do you appreciate her for that? Do you do you know what find out what her love language is? If it is gift, do you get her get her a gift or a token? Have you, when last have you bought her a rose? You know, when have, have you taken her on a date? When have you done something around the house that she has been asking you to do so that she can reciprocate to you sexually? When Solomon had finished complimenting the woman, she said to him. I have taken off my sandals. I have taken off my skirt. I have opened up to him. How can I put them back on again? How can she put on back her clothes after all of the compliments that she received from him? In Song of Solomon chapter 3, when they were having a conversation, right? And, 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 and Solomon looks at her and he says, a garden enclosed his sister, my spouse. Eh? He, he talks about the beauty of her garden. Her response was, Come, O oh north wind, and blow on my garden. These pleasant juices may flow out. Gentlemen, you need to learn how to blow. Eh? Because there are a lot of juices in the garden that needs to come out. But you are not complimenting. You are not doing anything that is affirming. You are not doing anything that is affirming your spouse. And so you need to do something that is affirming to her. And if you do, you can get a smooth sailing or a turbulent ride, and the choice is yours. Yeah? Husband, you have to understand that the tongue is mightier than the sword and sex is no longer penis dependent. So you have to get familiar with your wife, subject with your clip, get familiar with it, right? And stop trying to erase it. So you're rubbing it like you want it to disappear. Get familiar with it and give it the tender touch that it needs. Yes, one of our nice loves has coined the word. He said, I want a man with a slow hand. I want a lover with an easy touch. I want somebody who can understand, not come and go in a heated rush. So gentlemen, you have to get familiar with your wife's sexuality. Get to understand her. Get to know her. Get to understand her erogenous zones that God has given to her. God's the word of the Lord tells us in Psalm 139, 13 and 14 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And the works of the Lord in us is marvelous. Your wife is intricate. She's diverse both on the inside and the outside. She's a hidden secret. That's why, oh, that's why our sex organ is internal. Yours is outside, but ours is internal. Because we're a secret that you need to find. You can, you can actually hold your breath because you don't even know when she's going to blow your brain. And that's not literally, right? So you need to know, right? Ladies, you need to throw out the pajamas. You need to, one, one of the chemicals that is released during, during um, a novelty in a marriage, you know, is it, it, oxy, uh, it, oxytocin. Right, and it is called the cuddle hormone. You need to get that. It is responsible for creating the strong desire that, that you have towards your partner in the novelty period of your and the way to recreate this desire after the infatuation has subsided or faded because you don't have physical touch anymore. It's for skin to skin contact that releases the oxytocin in it for, for spouses. So throw away your pajamas, man, and cuddle up and let the oxytocin flow. You don't have to turn, you know, you, you don't have to, to, to turn every naked opportunity into sex, of course. Right? But you can if you want to. Ladies, I know it's coming on to winter, whether you, I don't know where, where, where what, what, what area of the America you are, but still, you can still be sexy. You can allow yourself to be available, yeah, so that your spouse can see. He is a rose by sea. You are aroused by how you feel. Gentlemen, ladies are aroused by how we feel. It is how love we feel that we are aroused. So we don't, we don't get turned on by looking at you. It doesn't matter how nice and handsome or how you are. We are. We are not aroused by looking at you. We are aroused by how you treat us. So our minds have to get stimulated. My husband says, a woman is like a clothes iron. You have to plug her in and allow her to warm up before you get the smooth sailing and the turbulent right. But, but wise husbands need to see. They are visual. They need to touch. Yeah? I don't know if I can walk past my husband three times and I'm not touching unless I'm upset about something. Right? Skin to skin contact. It is important. Yeah? I had an activity in my last sweet escape in October last. And we clocked it at 20 seconds for hugs and kisses. Right? And it was a real challenge for the couples in the activity to focus on kissing for an extended period of time. 
they had to be going turning upside down and jumping upon each other and all of that because you can't even hold each other's attention that long. You understand? And so the next time you are with your partner, try making those hugs and kisses last a little bit longer. It's all about the artificially and consciously recreating the chemical cocktail yeah, that you had in the beginning. And you have had to earn romance instead of it to be on to you. Work for it. Do the things that are important. And, and at the nights when you're on your bed, roll towards your spouse, man, and place your hands around them and breathe them in deeply. Breathe upon them. You could, you could kiss the back of their neck. The TV can, can be the biggest barrier sometimes. So I don't, I don't, I don't have any night in that night, baby. But sometimes you have to press the off button and just pay attention. Yeah? And schedule, schedule, schedule the sex if you have to schedule it. Whatever it is that you need to do, you need to do it. Sex has four stages. Yeah? I think it's, it's there. Um, um, I think I put it there. Yes. Sex has four stages. This is according to the, it's, a, it's, a, it's not the Johnson Johnson, it's the Masters and Johnson's model. The Masters and Johnson's model says sex has four stages, right? It talks about the excitement or the arousal stage, then the plateau stage, climax or the orgasm stage, and then the resolution or the refractory period, right? And, and, and a lot of the time, gentlemen, you have covered all four stages and your wives have not even reached the arousal. We are, we are not even excited. We are, we are here wondering what you're going on about because our minds have not yet been stimulated. It is important that you understand that we must both cover all four stages. You can't afford to get there before us. The lovemaking process is the only place where there should be a competition. This is where you see where you can outplease your spouse. So gentlemen, sometimes you need to give the ladies a jump start. You need to give them a little head start. Yes, and, and head can be literal right here. You need to give them a little head start. Allow them to have a couple of orgasms before you think of having your ejaculation, yes? Because if you, if you understand your wife and you understand that her love organ, her love button, which is her clitoris, is not placed inside of her vagina. This is on top of it. And I have been daring people for, my, for the longest while now to tell me of a sex position that can cause the clitoris and the penis to come in contact with each other. There's no such sex position. But if you are creative enough to create one, you can tell me. So I can add it to my book when I'm revising it. Right? But if you look where it is placed, it's placed on top. That means it needs touch. It needs touch outside of penetration. So it needs either your finger, which I call a contact switch, which has to be lubricated. But if it's dry, it's going to create a problem. Or it needs your tongue. Like I said, the tongue is mighty than the sword. Right? If you know how to handle it, then you can dangle it. You understand? So you need to know what you are supposed to do. And, and you're going to say, Reverend Dunbar, where did that come from? In the Bible. It may not have been stated that way, but I can take it to chapter and verse. Like I just shared with you from Songs of Solomon, chapter 3, just now. And I told her that when Solomon called his wife a garden, and he said, a garden includes my sister, my spouse. Then the sister said to him, his wife, come home north wind, because the man is referred to as a north wind. Come home north wind and blow on my garden, that its pleasant juices may flow out. You tell me. You do the math and tell me, because since I didn't do the math. Right? So you need to know what you need to do to ensure. Schedule the sex if you have to do it, man, right? But you, are, and you can definitely have much less sex in the first year. But if you know what each other likes and it's actually better, just making sure that you're staying sexually connected, right? Because you have to maximize what I call, I am going to be launching my, my, my marriage academy in another three weeks. I'll be launching the gym, um, which is the gym academy. And it is, and because I feel the necessity of teaching persons now how to sustain their marriage, how to be prepared for marriage. So on the 28th of, this, of, of next month, I'll be launching the gym academy and some of you can sign up for it, right? And the, well, the first course I'm going to be teaching is the marriage readiness. So you can tell the single people to sign up, 99 US dollars per person for the six week course that I'll be teaching on marriage preparation, to help persons to be ready for that, right? You can get in touch with my office for that. And I'm going to be teaching that because there's one, and there's also a course that I'm going to be teaching, you know, sexual proficiency course. I think that anything that we do, we should be wanting to be good at it. If you're an electrician, you want to be good at it. If you're a plumber, you want to be good at plumbing, right? If you're, if you're, if you're office admin, you want to be good at it. So if, 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 we're, if we have been given the ability to make wonderful love with each other, you must want to be good at it. Every married person should want to be great at lovemaking. Great, not good. 
great, be the best, right? You should want to give your spouse an epiphany each time you engage sexually. You should want to, to, to have them talking gibberish. Yes? Sex is not a spectator sport. You have to be involved in it. And this is where the competition begins, out-pleasing your partner. This is what you want to happen. You want to be able to out-please your partner every time. It's important, right? So you need to be aware of your spouse's motivational needs, right? You need to know what motivates your spouse. You have to know what your partner's sexual preferences are, yes? Some of you ladies, you have been married for so long, you don't know if it's a back shot, a lizard, lap, a roast duck, a picture frame, you don't know what it is. You need to know. Some husbands don't know what, what position their wife prefer. Some of you don't know how to handle the clitoris. Some of you are finding a flashlight to look for the G-spot. You need to know. That's why Moses gave the instruction, spend time to know your spouse. You need to become familiar with each other's sexuality. Eh? When, when was the last some of you late? Took your hot sex organ in your hand and eat it. Give it a nice look at chokes. Give it a name. Eh? When was the last time you took it out and look at it and say, Pata cake, a baker man, with it? You need to do that. Yes. You need to do it. When was the last time you took a good look at your wife's genitals? When was the last time you looked at it to see what it looks like? So to be able to, to become familiar with the beauty and the exquisiteness of the silkiness that you enjoy so much each time. Be familiar, become familiar with each other's sexuality and let go of your learned inhibitions. We have done declared that the church blundered in formative times and we failed to teach about sex. We have taken an Augustinian approach to sex. Sex is a necessary evil, right? And if you walk in the spirit, you'll not fulfill the loss of the flesh. God put us together and sex is a part of our marital responsibility to each other. First Corinthians 7 verses 3 to 5 made that very, very clear. Hebrew 13 verses 4 made it very, very clear. This is a responsibility that we have towards each other. So let go of your learned inhibition that there are some positions that are secular. Which one of them? You tell me. Because I think that Adam and Eve created the back shot. So which one of them is, is ungodly? I don't know. The Bible says in Hebrew 13, for anything that you both decide to do and consent to do together, not bringing in a third party. The only thing I have seen in prohibited is anal sex. I have seen that prohibited in the script text, so that is clear. But there's no position that you can want to get into. There's no sex, so there's no, you want to do it 30 times for the day. That's your business. It's between you and God. It's what your spouse can tolerate. It's what you consent to. So let go of learned inhibitions, which are not scriptural, and become sexually creative with each other. Something to what Adam and Eve have done. The Bible said they were both naked and unashamed. Can you imagine? Every time Adam saw his wife, he must be standing on three feet. So you need to do that. The, the truth is that critters never climax. Critters never climax, and we are having a climax now because it can get better. You have to get back to the basics. With romance, it's important. You must get back to the basics, right? You must get back to that place, right? Where, where, where you're dating and courting and complimenting. You have to get back to the basics. Date your spouse. If it's even at home, set aside some time. Send the children to their grandparents. Get a nanny. Something. Invest in your marriage, otherwise you're going to grow old and you're going to grow apart from each other. You're not going to find each other attractive anymore. Yeah? I, I took vacation in August and I ensured that I bought so many jean shorts. Very short shorts. Yes, because I need to look good for my husband. I need to. Right? So get back to the basics with romance. Get back to dating. Taking each other out. And it doesn't matter who plans the date. Because some of you quarrel over nothing. You know, all the time I have to initiate. So what? Initiate it. That is your strength. It's your strength. So initiate and do it. And stop bickering about who does it. It doesn't matter who. Marriage is a partnership. One is the head and one is the neck. Both of you are important. The head cannot turn your neck. But the neck has no eyes. So you need the head. You just need to understand. So get back to dating. Get back to complimenting. Affirming. Like Shalaman and his Shulamite wife. Her wife's husband needs affirmation for the things that they do. They like perfect, right? So you need to get back to compliment and affirming. Get to rekindling. Meet unmet needs. 
lot of the times marriage goes sour because of unmet need. Leave unmet need, right? And go to couples therapy and I recommend a relationship check every three months. I tell my clients, every three months, you get a, get a third party to, to check in. Go to a relationship therapy like myself and check in on your relationship. Check the temperature of your relationship and see what is happening there. Because sometimes what you really need is, an, is a person, a person who is an expert to tell you exactly what to do. And if in the end your butterfly phase has led to repetitive or worse and arguing or you feel completely disconnected from your partner or you feel resentment building up toward them, then you may want to consider coming for couples therapy, right? And seek a balance. Seek a balance between self and the couple because the strongest marriage relationship of two interdependent partners. And every individual has a life and you come together to invest in a marriage and relationship. You become one, but you are not the same. So you need to understand that, yes, yeah, sometimes a little breather is okay, right? Because, because, so, because if, if we don't do that, sometimes we can get on each other's nerves. But your love must remain undiluted. It must remain steadfast. It must remain constant. The romance doesn't have to wane if you don't want it to. We all balance, balance everything. We have to learn balance because balance is everything. Not perfect balance, you know, because nobody's perfect. Just balancing life's priority. You have to choose to love, but you must also choose to love effectively until death as your vows dictate. And that means doing love intentionally, actively, sexually, creatively for the healthy sustenance of your marriage and your family. I want to remind you this afternoon that wine gets better as it ages. It can only taste better. And I believe that you may have been holding your breath for far too long now. So here now is an in instructional necessity to release your breath and indulge your spouse with a tantalizing taste of something that you can do just to see who has the best wine. Every pun intended. I want you to leave from before me this afternoon and go and check out who has the best wine. Oh, taste and see that your wife and your husband is good. Who has the best wine? As intended, after all the wise man Solomon said it, he said, drink wine from your own cistern. Your husband and your wife is yours to drink. So take a drink now. Have a drink. And see how intoxicating it can be when you have made the decision to revitalize your romance and find each other interesting as when you first got together. I pray and I trust that I have been helpful in helping you to understand how to hold your breath, how to utilize the undiluted love, how to express it, how to share it, or to be one with each other in a God-honoring way that pleases God. Because the in they do not have the ability that we have. They've not been given the functionality that we have been given as husbands and wives to reproduce ourselves and our loves with each other and to share in the one world of love making and caring for each other and looking out for the interest of each other. God has divine directive, but it will take me the entire day to tell you everything. So I certainly will look forward to seeing you another time. But in the meantime, drink wine from your own sister. Go ahead and have a taste. My, 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 my. Wow. Ah, hold your breath. <laughs> Dr. Dunbar, wow. Listen, I, I think we want to replay even now. We have another session that's <laughs> waiting on us, but this has been so intense. It has been so full of uh, uh, knowledge and so much wealth that has been poured out this evening, one of God. 
I'm so humbled that you have accepted uh, just to come and share with us. And I'm sure, as you can see, what's happening in the chat, that they are just on fire right now. And, you know, it, it's just amazing that what God is doing in this season. And I want every single person, because I know those that are online know you're all married folks. So guess what? Uh, when you get back to the next session uh, later this evening, you're all white. We will be having Bishop Ruddock that will be doing a, a live virtual vow renewal. So up there all this heat and all this fire that has been released and it's time to rekindle the passion it's time just to get back to that place and say listen man ah i ain't gonna hold this written no more we're gonna <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna... Indeed. next time you have the your next time you need to put me closer to the night so that's when i finish with them they go they retire for bed uh, listen <laughs> listen we'll be in touch we will be in touch <laughs> Uh, bless you, woman of God. I'm so very humbled. And I just want, I know we, 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 we are strapped for time, but if there are any questions or any comments right now, this is the opportunity. Go right ahead. The, the, the sex doctor is in the house to prescribe to you right now what you need to take your, 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 your life, your, your bed, your intimacy to a next level. Go right ahead, people of God. You can go ahead and unmute your microphone. <laughs> well, Lady okay, Latoya, hi. Oh, no. right. can you hear me? Sure. It's Olivia. Um, so, Dr. Dunbar, thank you so much for that awesome presentation as a newlywed. And I'm, I'm pregnant at the moment, so I'm having some intimacy issue because I'm not feeling for it. Spooning so, baby. what? Spooning. Spooning is what you do. <laughs> <laughs> Repeat. <laughs> I, I said your, your sexual position has a lot to do with spooning at this time. Oh, so you think that would uh, that would help <laughs> in getting it going more. then? Have <laughs> your question. Right. What's your question? Yes, yeah, so I was saying that um the hormone levels are not not so hot right now. Um, so what is it that you think mm -hmm. you could suggest that I do to like satisfy my husband during this time because he's going crazy? It's been a few months. <laughs> so I want to, uh, you know, spice it up a little. Yeah, I know, I know the, the temperament and the hormonal changes when you get pregnant. And as I said earlier on, it has to be something that is decisive and intentional because us women are not wired as highly sexual as our men, right? So our, our decision has to be intentional to understand that like a car needs just to function, a man needs sex to function. So you have to have it somewhere in the back of your head that even if you don't feel up to, because what the truth is, you know, once you start and he starts doing the right things, you are going to get into the mood. It is just that you do not have the natural inclination, especially now with the hormonal challenges. But if you just decide to be cuddled, to cuddle and, and, and just lie together and just cuddle, then you will start feel closer to him. And then it will, it will result in you satisfying eventually. Right? Because like I said earlier, we are said to be like a close eye and we need a little warm up. So for the initiation for you is going to be a challenge at this time because of the hormonal challenges. But if you just spend some time in intimacy, not sex, just intimacy, just cuddle, just talk, and then it will have a build up. You understand? It will have a build up if you do that. There are, but because you're pregnant, I, I mean, Nothing should be prescribed for you at this time. It just has to be natural. So you just have to be intentional about it. Hobby has to understand the hormonal change, but you have to also understand that he doesn't have a want. He has a need. And you are responsible for that need, right? And so you both can just come together and decide how it's done. But if you cuddle a lot more, you'll, it will be more favorable for you to have sex. All right, thank you. There's one person here asking, what if you want to do something, but I don't like it? Okay. If your reason for not liking it is selfish, then it's not a reason. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verses 3 to 5 tells you unequivocally that you are to see to it that you meet the sexual need of your spouse. And your desires must be for your own husband. So if you are withholding yourself just because you don't like it, it's not a reason. It's not a valid reason. It's not legitimate. If it is something that 
you're uncomfortable with the cause of this, your upbringing, your Christian upbringing, you learned something when you were growing up and you're not sure and you feel like you're going to commit a sin and stuff like that, then that's something you should explain to your husband. And that's something that you should seek help for to clarify. Because the word of the Lord through the prophet Hosea says, my people suffer because of lack of knowledge. And a lot of the times it is a lack of knowledge why we are not doing the things that we ought to do in our relationship. And so if there's something that your husband wants to do and you don't like it, it's not a legitimate reason, but if it's something that makes you uncomfortable because of something that you knew before or something like that, discuss it with him and get help to ensure that that goes on. Because let me tell you something, the only sure way to affair proof your marriage is to do what the Lord says you're supposed to do. And he says, if you abstain from sex, but sexual, sexual intercourse for an extended period of time, then persons are going to be drawn away by, because they're unable to control themselves because it's a need. Females don't cheat for sex, not necessarily. We cheat for affection, but husbands will cheat for sex. Um, are any other questions? Any other question? <laughs> yes, yeah, somebody wants to take a sip. Take a sip and take a drink. Just don't choke. <laughs> any other question? <laughs> any other question? Minister Grant, you can unmute your mic if you want to talk. I have not seen any more questions coming up on the chat. Everybody is saying the thing is too short. And they wanted more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. They wanted more. But I have to send you to go get some time with each other. That's right. Oh, That's um, some new messages are coming in. What if you, you are resistant because, because of hurt? Um, that's why I say you need a professional help. Because if you are about hurt... If, it, if, you're, if you're hurting, as a female especially, or either way, you really cannot gravitate and reciprocate whatever your spouse is trying. So you, you need to get rid of that. So that needs to be dealt with in a professional way. If it is that you can talk to your spouse about the hurt, and then by talking to your spouse about the hurt, he or she understands, and you're able to make amends so that you can start afresh, then fine. But if it is something that needs a third party intervention, then you have to get that so that you don't withhold yourself because to withhold yourself is wrong. And you don't want to be trying to please God and displease him God at the same time. It doesn't make sense, right? Um, how can we contact you outside of this forum? I am on Facebook, um, Carla Dunbar Ministries. I am on Twitter, Reverend Carla Dunbar. I'm on Instagram, Carla Dunbar Ministries. You can contact me via email at Carla Dunbar Ministries at gmail.com and it's Carla with a C. So it's Carla Dunbar Ministries at gmail.com. You can write my office or you can reach us at 876 782 7646. That's 876 782 7646. You can reach us on WhatsApp so it doesn't cost you. So any one of the social media platforms. And as I said, we'll be launching my online Grow Your Marriage Academy. In, in a few weeks' time. So you can look out for that. There is sex scription. That's sex scription right there. So you can, you can purchase a copy of sex scription if you want it. Um, it's on Amazon. And um, I have the, the couple's devotional is also on Amazon. Um, you can also have the couple's devotional as well. What is your take on having sex to secular music with your hobby? I don't have a problem with that. You, I, if God don't have a problem, you don't have a problem. Would you like to have sex making love to um, Amazing Grace or Sweet as on? Or I worship you, Lord? I don't think so. Right? Um, everything has a context, okay? It depends on what you are able to tolerate. That's between you and God. That's a couple's devotional. And it's a couple's devotional workbook, which is also going to be the textbook for, one, for my marriage maintenance course that's going to be coming up on the, uh, the gym academy. And on which is being launched on October 28th. So um, it's, it's whatever pleases you and whatever is okay. The word of the Lord says that your husband must give you purifying love. That means you shouldn't be, your husband or wife should not lead you to do anything that will cause you to feel impure. But if something goes against your Christian conscience, talk about it, okay? What if you are living in separate places? If you are living in separate places, use, use up social media. Do what we are sexting. 
Yes, use of social aid. You're, you're having a date with me right now. You can you know with your spouse just like this. You can make love with your spouse just like this. Be creative. Go to creative. Go have some of his creative genes. Use it. Any other question? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, someone just Any other someone just sent um, a private message. I believe they don't want to put it out. So uh, what about early ejaculation? How do you correct that? And I believe that will be the final question for this session. Okay. Um, so I would need to be in, um, have you in therapy for that. Um, okay. Early ejaculation, most of the time, stems from a trained mind. Um, especially for men um, and boys, they masturbate. You know, they... Sigmund Freud would talk about the expert he said when little boys go and start seeing this thing hanging down and touching it and it feels nice and so they start masturbating at an early age and, and, and masturbation is really a, usually a horrid experience and so you just want to hurry up and reach the ejaculation point and so your brain has been trained to ejaculate quickly and so now you are married and you have a wife but you are still ejaculating quickly. That could be the case as well as there are other things that could cause that as well. And so that is why I would need to meet with you on a one-on-one -on -one session, which I, which I can do on video, like just like this. I have a lot of international clients all across the world that I need like this, and I can make the recommendations um, because some things may need, may be physical, but some things are psychological. So it's something that can be relearned, retrained, something that I can give you a therapy and you can overcome that. It's not detrimental. No, you know, but if you don't treat it, it can be detrimental to your relationship because your wife will not be pleased. Wow. All right, and that's a wrap. I believe that that we have, we were very engaging in, in this session. Uh, yeah. you get I, said, I just want to release, and so let me just release a blessing before I leave. Yeah. You know, I I I I pray for your love that it continues to be the kind of love embodied in John three sixteen that you love each other irrevocably, that you love each other without any inhibitions, that your love for each other will multiply, have a multiplying effect and grow and reproduce more love. I declare right now and decree that your marriages will outlast you. I declare now that the word of the Lord spoken about your marriage, that no thing shall by any means separate you because God has joined you together. I declare even now and speak over your sex lies that it will be that it will be fruitful and satisfying and that it will be intoxicating as God intends. I declare and decree over your lives now for those of you who are in need of children that you will be you will reproduce like God said and replenish and that you your, your seed, the seed of your lines will be will be a blessing. The fruit of your womb will also be a blessing. I pray God's eternal blessing and favor upon your lives and your marriage and your ministries right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that as you continue to look to him the hills from whence cometh your help that as he gives you the help that you need you will glorify him may his favor shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you his everlasting peace both now and forevermore and in whatever you do whatever you put your hands to may it flourish like the tree that is planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season may you have exclusive Focus for each other for the rest of your lives together and may God in heaven continue to pour out his blessing upon you in Jesus' name. Jesus.